The reading today can be found in the bulletin on pages 15 and 16. It comes today from the book of Acts, chapter 13, verse 1, through chapter 14, verse 27. Now there were in the church at Antioch prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manaen, a lifelong friend of Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. So being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia, and from there they sailed to Cyprus. When they arrived at Salamis, they proclaimed the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews, and they had John to assist them. When they had gone through the whole island as far as Paphos, they came upon a certain magician, a Jewish false prophet named Bar-Jesus. He was with the proconsul Sergius Paulus, a man of intelligence, who summoned Barnabas and Saul and sought to hear the word of God. But Elymas, the magician, for that is the meaning of his name, opposed them, seeking to turn the proconsul away from the faith. But Saul, who was also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked intently at him and said, You son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, full of all deceit and villainy, will you not st stop making crooked the straight paths of the Lord? Now behold, the hand of the Lord is upon you, and you will be blind and unable to see the sun for a time. Immediately, mist and darkness fell upon him, and he went about seeking people to lead him by the hand. Then the proconsul believed when he saw what had occurred, for he was astonished at the teaching of the Lord. Now Paul and his companions set sail from Paphos and came to Perga in Pamphylia. And John left them and returned to Jerusalem, but they went on from Perga and came to Antioch in Pisidia. And on the Sabbath day, they went into the synagogue and sat down. After the reading from the Law and the Prophets, the rulers of the synagogue sent a message to them saying, Brothers, if you have any word of encouragement for the people, say it. So Paul stood up and motioning with his hand said, Men of Israel and you who fear God, listen. The God of this people Israel chose our fathers and made the people great during their stay in the land of Egypt. And with uplifted arm, he led them out of it. And for about 40 years, he put up with them in the wilderness. And after destroying seven nations in the land of Canaan, he gave them their land as an inheritance. All this took about 450 years. After that, he gave them judges until Samuel the prophet. Then they asked for a king. And God gave them Saul, the son of Kish, a man of the tribe of Benjamin, for 40 years. And when he had removed him, he raised up David to be their king, of whom he testified and said, I have found in David, the son of Jesse, a man after my heart, who will do all my will. Of this man's offspring, God has brought to Israel a savior, Jesus, as he promised. Before his coming, John had proclaimed a baptism of repentance to all the people of Israel. And as John was finishing his course, he said, What do you suppose that I am? I am not he. No, but behold, after me one is coming, the sandals of whose feet I am not worthy to tie. Brothers, sons of the family of Abraham and those among you who fear God, to us has been sent the message of salvation. For those who live in Jerusalem and their rulers, because they did not recognize him, nor understand the utterances of the prophets, which are read every Sabbath, they fulfilled them by condemning him. And though they found in him no guilt worthy of death, they asked Pilate to have him executed. And when they had carried out all that was written of him, they took him down from the tree and laid him in a tomb. But God raised him up from the dead, and for many days he appeared to those who had come up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem, who are now his witnesses to the people. And we bring you the good news that what God has promised to the fathers, this he has fulfilled to us, their children, 
by raising Jesus, as it is also written in the second psalm. You are my son. Today I have begotten you. And as for the fact that he was raised from the dead, no more to return to corruption, he has spoken in this way. I will give you the holy and sure blessing of David. Therefore, he says also in another psalm, you will not let your Holy One see corruption. For David, when he had served the purpose of God in his own generation, fell asleep and was laid with his fathers and his body saw corruption. But he whom God raised up did not see corruption. Let it be known to you, therefore, brothers, that through this man forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you, and by him everyone who believes is freed from everything from which you could not be freed from the law of Moses. Beware, therefore, lest what is said by the prophet should come about. Look, you scoffers, be astounded and perish, for I am doing a work in your days, a work that you will not believe, even if one tells it to you. As they went out, the people begged that these things might be told to them next Sabbath. And after meeting with the synagogue, after the meeting of the synagogue broke up, many Jews and devout converts to Judaism followed Paul and Barnabas, who, as they spoke with them, urged them to continue in the grace of God. The next Sabbath, almost the whole city gathered to hear the word of the Lord. But when the Jews saw the crowds, they were filled with jealousy and began to contradict what was spoken by Paul, reviling him. And Paul and Barnabas spoke out boldly, saying, It was necessary that the word of God be spoken first to you. Since you thus thrust it aside and judge yourselves unworthy of eternal life, behold, we are turning to the Gentiles. For so the Lord has commanded us, saying, I have made you a light for the Gentiles, that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. And when the Gentiles heard this, they began rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord. And as many as were appointed to eternal life believed. And the word of the Lord was spreading throughout the whole region. But the Jews incited the devout women of high standing, and the leading men of the city stirred up persecution against Paul and Barnabas and drove them out of their district. But they shook off the dust from their feet against them and went to Iconium, and the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. Now at Iconium, they entered together into the Jewish synagogue and spoke in such a way that a great number of both Jews and Greeks believed. But the unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles and poisoned their minds against the brothers. So they remained for a long time, speaking boldly for the Lord, who bore witness to the word of his grace, granting signs and wonders to be done by their hands. But the people of the city were divided. Some sided with the Jews and some with the apostles. When an attempt was made by both Gentiles and Jews with their rulers to mistreat them and to stone them, they learned of it and fled to Lystra and Derbe, cities of Lyconia, and to the surrounding country, and there they continued to preach the gospel. Now at Lystra, there was a man sitting who could not use his feet. He was crippled from birth and had never walked. He listened to Paul speaking, and Paul, looking intently at him, seeing that he had faith to be made well, said in a loud voice, Stand upright on your feet. And he sprang up and began walking. And when the crowd saw what Paul had done, they lifted up their voices, saying in Lyconian, The gods have come down to us in the likeness of men. Barnabas they called Zeus and Paul Hermes, because he was the chief speaker. And the priest of Zeus, whose temple was at the entrance to the city, brought oxen and garlands to the gates and wanted to offer sacrifice with the crowds. But when the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard of it, they tore their garments and rushed out into the crowd, crying out, Men, why are you doing these things? We also are men of like nature with you, and we bring you good news that you should turn from these vain things to a living God who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. In past generations, he allowed the nations to walk in their own ways, yet he did not leave himself without witness, for he did good by giving you rains from heaven and fruitful seasons, satisfying your hearts with food and gladness. 
Even with these words, they scarcely restrained the people from offering sacrifice to them. But Jews came from Antioch and Iconium, and having persuaded the crowds, they stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, supposing that he was dead. But when the disciples gathered about him, he rose up and entered the city, and on the next day he went on with Barnabas to Derbe. When they had preached the gospel to that city and had made many disciples, they returned to Lystra and to Iconium and to Antioch, strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith, and saying that through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God. And when they had appointed elders for them in every church with prayer and fasting, they committed them to the Lord in whom they had believed. Then they passed through Pisidia and came to Pamphylia. And when they had spoken the word in Perga, they went down to Atalia. And from there they sailed to Antioch, where they had been commended to the grace of God for the work that they had fulfilled. And when they arrived and gathered the church together, they declared all that God had done with them and how he had opened a door of faith to the Gentiles. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, to be, God. be to God. Thank you, Gary. Friends, grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. St. Paul is righteous. He is consumed with hope because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He is forgiven, and he is therefore truly free. He's full of faith and hope and love. He is courageous, he is driven, he is learned, and he lives with conviction and with power. In the face of falsehood, as you read Paul's writing, his, his righteous anger bubbles and sometimes even boils over. We love this man, our namesake here at St. Paul's, because, because he loves Christ and his church so much and his fellow believers so much, right? Did you hear this just a minute ago? That he marched right back in to those places and those towns that had mocked him and stoned him and left him for dead. I should have shown you a map. I thought about doing that before the service. If you picture modern-day Turkey, they land in the middle of the southern coast, they go west and north up to Antioch and then down to the south and the east and they end up finally in Derby. And if you look at the old ancient Roman roads, it's not too far when in Derby. It wouldn't have been too far at all for him to keep going on that road and to go home to Tarsus. And instead they turned around, right back to where they had stoned him, right back to where they had run him out of town, right back to where they had mocked him. It's great courage. We love it. This man who loves Christ's church so much, and I hope you heard this, right back into all those towns Paul and Barnabas went, and Paul anointed pastors in each congregation, shepherds, to serve God's flock, preaching and teaching and administering the means of grace and rejoicing with those who rejoice and weeping with those who weep, that together we all might breathe and live the gospel. I loved all of this. I love Paul's courage, and I have for years. But everything has a context. Even sermons have a context. Every family has a context. Every gathering of God's people has a context. Right? You come here, and some of you are here this morning because, well, this is what you do. And that's a great thing, isn't it? Now, some of you are perhaps dragged here and you'd just as soon be home and sleeping or perhaps watching replays of the Olympics or Brett Favre's Hall of Fame speech from last night or perhaps you're here and you're searching for something and you're just not sure. So again, everything has a context. Like I told you when you called me to be your pastor here, when you call a pastor, you call a man, not a robot. And I have to tell you, that in the context in the last few weeks of hearing about these missionary journeys and reading them and discussing them as we prepare for these, I, I am just 
I am amazed with the courage and the hope and the faith of St. Paul, of, of Paul and Barnabas just going, whatever the consequences may be, going where the Spirit leads. And I haven't been able to get something out of my mind. In the last six months, I have done three funerals for young people here at St. Paul's. And I will tell you as we continue here that I have talked to each of the families involved and I have, been, I have received permission to mention the names, to speak about the lives involved and broadly speaking about the circumstances of the deaths. One of those funerals less than a month ago was one of ours, Erica Reiner, who was 15 years old. Erica is a great kid with a great heart and a great musician and loved to help people. She struggled with depression. She wrestled with God a little bit in the midst of that struggle. She got sucked into trying some things that were very dangerous for her including heroin. And she didn't wake up. Logan Rankin was 19, also one of ours. Again, a great kid with a heart and who loved to help people, and, but from the time that he was a little boy, struggled with depression. And as many do, self-medicated, including heroin. And one day, in a fit of despair, his life ended. Austin Pulver is the oldest son, 21, of one of our newest members here at St. Paul's, Rich Pulver. Austin had been through a lot. And Austin was in the midst of all this chaos that he had endured as a boy, was filled with love for his siblings and acted as the protector and just loved and cared for them in every way he could. And yet Austin, from the time he was little too, struggled with depression and self-medicated, including in the last couple months with heroin. He had just turned the corner, it seemed. He was planning to, his life was starting to change and then he got suckered in to one more time. And just over a week ago, he didn't wake up. All of this in the last six months. I have been praying a lot in these last months. And I'm not entirely sure yet. But I know that for me, I have to do something. I feel like as people of the resurrection, we have to do something. I think of Paul, right? Paul and Barnabas, who love Christ's people so much, and Lystra and Derby and Iconium and Antioch, that he marched right back into those places and encouraged them and lift them up and appointed pastors who would preach and administer the sacraments and pray for the sick and bind up the brokenhearted. Paul, right? And Barnabas, whose courage and faith inspired whole communities, a whole region of the earth, to cling to Christ in faith and in hope, even in the face of difficulty. I think of Jesus, who, as the letter of the Hebrews tells us, for the joy set before him, for the joy set before him, endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. And then verse 3 in Hebrews 12 says, Consider him who endured such things from sinful men so that we do not grow weary and lose heart. Jesus did that for all of us, for all of us, for you. He was stripped and beaten and mocked, and still he picked up that cross, and he carried it to Golgotha, where we, as St. Peter says in his Pentecost sermon, where we drove nails through his hands and his feet. He took the punishment for all of your failure to do the right thing when you could have, and for mine. For all of our failure, all our doings, 
of the wrong thing. He took it all. For you, for me, for all. As St. Peter says in his great Pentecost sermon, for all who are far off, for all God's children. Christ, the the eternal Son of God, died and rose for all. Christ paid the price for my guilt and shame. Christ paid the price for your guilt and shame. Christ paid the price for all our guilt and shame. And in him, therefore, because he is risen from the dead, we are, therefore, free. Friends, living as a Christian minority, whether in the first century A.D. or the 21st century A.D., has always meant clinging to Christ in faith and acting in Christ. Paul says this powerfully at the end of 1 Corinthians 13. Faith, hope, and love abide, these three. But the greatest of these is love. Love is Christian faith in action. So I don't know about you, but in these last few months, I've gotten past the point or I'm worried about offending people, or being uncomfortable, or about my family. I think about Erica, think about Logan, think about Austin. I think about you. I think about my kids and their friends. Think about all these kids that I see walking down here playing Pokemon Go on their phones and on their bikes. And I know that we, as people of the resurrection, must do something. Now, don't misunderstand me here. I am not in despair. In fact, it is quite totally the opposite. I am filled with hope because we know that Jesus Christ is raised from the dead. And I know that I have some small part. And I know that you do too. And so I ask you, what about you? For whom in your life is it past the time simply to talk? It's not the talk is unimportant. Not the preaching and teaching is unimportant. But for whom in your life is it past time? Is it perhaps just the right time to act, to go, to do? Then in prayer, in humility, do it. Right? For whom in your life is it time not just to talk? And again, that's not just a bad thing. For whom in your life is it time to go and to act? then for God's sake, do it. Because the love of Christ is faith in action. And Christ is risen. Remember that? Christ is risen. Christ is risen. Come on, people. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed Hallelujah. May the peace of God, which passes all understanding, guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. We rise for prayer.